where is my health data? Most consumers have no idea. And it's, you know, it's buried in these antiquated IT systems that are in, you know, on-prem deployment sitting in a basement somewhere and a server that hasn't been touched in 15 years. It's, you know, there aren't modern APIs to get to these systems. They're very fragmented. It's very, healthcare data is an incredibly fragmented. Welcome to Uptech Report. This is our Applied Tech series. Uptech Report is sponsored by TerraLeap. Learn how to leverage the power of video at TerraLeap.io. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Andre Pop, who's the CEO and founder of Human API. Welcome, Andre. Good to have you on, man. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Alex. Now, um, hey, Human API started 2014. Recently, guys, the last round you did was a Series C. The whole goal, if I understand correctly, is to make structured digital health data available on any consumer in real time. So it's all around this, this term of health data liquidity. Okay, in the name itself, human API, basically everything around our cells, letting that data be available for other folks and ourselves, the access of it. Help me understand, like, take me back, why did you set out to solve this and what is the problem that you set to solve? Sure, yeah. So I, I think, look, there's a, the, the healthcare industry, really what human API is all about is, is trying to empower folks who are innovating in, in the healthcare space, right? Nobody looks at healthcare and thinks that we're moving at the right pace. You know, everybody wants it to be better. And if you start to look at the industry as a whole, you realize that one of the most fundamental problems that it faces is this lack of data liquidity, which is just a fancy way of saying that healthcare data is hard to get, make sense of, and use. And so what we really set out to build at Human API is this um, one-stop shop, right? This, this simple modern transaction layer of healthcare data. So that as a consumer, and it's really, really critical that the consumer be at the center of this entire experience. That's why we called it Human API. It's one of our most important core values. It's all about how that consumer can share his or her data with places that they find value. So it could be, you know, when they're buying insurance, when they're switching employers, when they're enrolling in a clinical trial, when they're checking into their doctor's office, most recently as part of the COVID reopening, when they're demonstrating that they've had a negative test result or a vaccine. And it's all about, so what, what we've basically done is we built this network of real-time connectivity to what now spans 295 million Americans or so. So most of the country um, you know, again, with their consent, of course, and only so with their consent, we'd be able to transact data in real time. And that's, nobody else has done that, right? It's, it's literally us and then, you know, there are fax machines. <laughs> and that's how people try to transact data. Um, and so it's really by bringing that, that modern transaction layer to the world that we try to solve that problem of data liquidity, which our whole thesis is if we do that, then the folks that pick that up, that pick up our APIs and build with them, whether they be, you know, two guys in a garage working on a startup or some of the innovation teams at the world's biggest companies, they're going to be the ones that push the world forward, that push the industry forward. So if I understand correctly, what you've done is, is the, the, the groundwork, all the hard work of going to all the data sources, whether they're hospitals, their labs, pharmacies, or, or, or networks, uh, healthcare um, insurance networks, and be able to get the data out of them, make the connections with them, so then an API to a developer that can create something. And then as the person, they then can sign up for this app and then give consent to all their uh, data to come through the app. Am I yep. describing yeah, it well? Yeah, you are. I mean, I think the, so, so absolutely the network that we've built. So we've done over 40,000 integrations across the country, uh, labs, hospitals, electronic health record systems, uh, pharmacies, devices. So not a lot of people know we've got a huge device network. Every, every wearable or sensor that you can think of. Um, and the way you find out about human API is typically through one of our customers' products. So we embed our solution, our platform in our customers' products. So think of the checkout with PayPal experience for your health data instead of for your money. So you found out about PayPal through eBay or you know wherever. And then if it was your first time using it, you said, oh, what's this service? Well, I could send a check in the mail right? That would be slow and boring and terrible. Or there's this new thing called PayPal. Let me check it out. Let me sign up. Human API works the same way. So let's say it's one of our, you know, you're applying for life insurance or you're trying to get a disability claim filed with one of our big insurance customers. And they'll say, hey, this could take you four, six, eight weeks. Or 
we have this service called Human API that you can sign up and plug in your username and password, and 30 seconds later, we've got it all sorted out. So that's just one example. Gotcha. So the, the, as a consumer, I'm not going to go to Human API and just make a, an account by itself. It's the idea of I'm signing up for a service or, 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 or application, and I see the ability to check out, is your terms, uh, to, to, to sign in. And then that gives all the data which you, through your, your network to that application that I'm going to use. Yep. So that's how it starts. Now, what's really important to understand is that that's the first time that you hear about or use Human API, just like you would with PayPal. Now, what you're going to see is in the future, because we've got this massive ecosystem of partners that create value for consumers, Human API is increasingly becoming the place that a consumer might, you know, you're, you're going to discover us through, let's say, uh, a John Hancock, a AAA, a, one of our big clients, or you know, one of the, the digital health companies that we work with, like an Omada Health, for example. But then you're going to find very quickly that once you've connected your health data, that, that identity and that data persists with you. And, you know, we store and manage it on your behalf, again, with your consent. You can always delete it uh, at any time. But if you stay there and kind of keep it with us, like a bank, right, storing your money, there are things that you can do with it to unlock value for yourself. And so those are some of the things that, you know, were the, the ecosystem of partners that we have start to deliver for you. In this whole era of privacy and who owns the data around ourselves is, is so critical. And it sounds like that you put that as, as a mentality first of we as consumers, we own our data and then we have the right to use it. And what you're doing is just enabling us to use the data in more ways. One, 100%. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of our core tenants and actually one of our most important values is to serve, we call it serve the human first. So this idea, and this, this plays out in, in a lot of different ways across our company, but at the center, it's all about the consumer. It's all about the, the human being behind that data. It's, you know, your healthcare data is your most sensitive and most important asset. I would argue even more so than your money, right? Because uh, your money, it's much more fungible, right? Your healthcare, that's with you for life. And obviously it's, it's so sensitive and critical in so many ways that, it is core to our model. We have to take that incredibly seriously. It's baked into our DNA. And the only way that I believe that you can solve this, this challenge in healthcare of, of this data typically being a liquid is not by obfuscating the consumer, which is how so many companies try to do it, right? They try to do it without involving the consumer. They try to sell that data to third parties and, and sometimes nefarious ways. And our model is ask the consumer to share his or her data and only what the consumer permissions is what we'll share. In doing that, you empower that consumer and the business that's creating value for that consumer. So you, you, with having that mentality first, then what you've done is you also open this up as an API to, to developers. I, I bet this is, is a, a big opportunity then for those that are looking to build new applications in the healthcare space. More probably one of the hardest things was to get access to the to data. Am I correct on that? Yep, absolutely. So I think if, if you, I mean, healthcare interoperability or lack thereof, right, is, is one of the biggest challenges facing the industry because, you know, we all know that in order to push industries forward, right, we want the entrepreneurs that are building these next generation products to have access to, to data and to users, right? I mean, fundamentally, that's, that's what's holding a lot of this innovation back. And especially when you're in such a complex industry as healthcare, right? It's it's not it's not straightforward to uh, to just you know hang out your shingle and 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 try to uh, try to start a company and, and and suddenly be able to reach you know millions. There's a story I like to tell from, and I think it'll bring home this idea of us being enablers. So, are, are you familiar with Twilio? The mm -hmm. yeah. So so there are, for those that aren't, so Twilio is a telecommunications API company and. They, uh, you know, they, when they went public, I read their, their S1, their filing, and there were, they were about 250 million in revenue at the time, give or take. And there were two companies on there that were disclosed by name in the public filing because of the substantial contribution to Twilio's revenue that they represented. And those two companies, uh, I think they were about 15% and 7% of the revenue respectively. And they were WhatsApp and Uber. And now here's what's really interesting. Um, so Twilio just enabled Uber to send text messages back and forth and, and WhatsApp the same, right? Um, creating liquidity of communication in that market. Neither of those two companies existed when Twilio was founded. 
And so the reason that I bring this up is it's a, it's a really good example of, you know, we don't really know where the future innovation is going to come from, right? We know that we're enablers, we're, we're toolsmiths. You know, you asked for, or you asked about an API for developers, right? It's, it's really great when you can empower teams that are out there solving existing problems, like, hey, I need a you know, better, faster digital fax machine <laughs> as an API. But the real innovation is going to come from the folks that, you know, where, where we can't even imagine what those projects will be. But by enabling that ecosystem, by making that data liquid, you're encouraging developers that are out there building stuff to just try things. And you've lowered that barrier to entry so we can push the industry forward as a whole. Lowering the, the barrier to entry for development of new ideas. That, that's like the, what you see as the future is what, you've de- what you're working on and doing is in when it comes to healthcare applications or opportunities or, or, or new ideas, it's coming. It's basically, we, we don't know what's coming, but so, what something is because you, you provide that, that um, liquidity of the data. Totally. What, what a choice of words. How me understand for is someone being able to use this? Is it, is it just effectively like a, any other type of API connection? I mean, what's, if so, like a developer say, I want to sign up and start using it. What does that process look like? Yep. Yeah, so I mean, you, you can go on our website. We've got all the all our documentation is public. It's all open. You can start, you know, playing around with it. Obviously, we've got a, you know, a, a very engaged sales team that will reach out to you and kind of help you through stuff. Solutions consulting as you're prototyping or working things out. And we've got also a suite of solutions across a number of different markets, right? So I mentioned some of the some of the markets we 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 play in our insurance the pharmaceutical value chain. So, so clinical trial recruitment, uh, clinical trial screening. We work a lot with digital health. We work a lot with what we call real-time health ID. So that's all of the COVID uh, reopening, but even spanning beyond COVID, right? All of the new solutions that are being tailored directly for consumers in the healthcare space. Uh, and so you can just, as a developer, you go online, just start playing with it, and typically there's, you know, you'll, you'll find that with our SDKs, with our documentation, you can just drop it in and immediately get, you know, this experience where any one of your consumers can say, you know, I've got medical records at, I'm on the West Coast, Kaiser, let's say, and I've got prescriptions at CVS and Walgreens, and I've got some labs at Quest, and I, you know, used to go to UCSF and I own a Fitbit. And we connect to all of those and 40,000 other sources. And so you click that and 30 seconds later, your data shows up and it's normalized and and it all happens in real time. It's super simple. For you, were you in healthcare at all before this or did you just see the opportunity? Like how did, how did this happen? How did this come together? Yeah, not, not at all. In fact, I I came at this very much from a, from an engineering and a data science background. So I, I think that the, um, you know, there's a, I, I spent a little bit of time in the quantified self, what's called the quantified self world, uh, which is really folks that are, uh, you know, into self tracking. So when the first sensors started coming out, you know, I'm one of these guys that gets a blood test every three months, you know, I was an athlete, I super quantified everything. And then, uh, you know, I, I didn't really believe that was going to be a market in the near term, at least. But we, um, when I, when I sold my first company in 2013, we, uh, we were working on a product that was a CRM for physiotherapists. This was up in, in Vancouver, Canada at the time. And we looked at the U.S. market because the, the Canadian market was too small for what we were trying to do. And that was when I first got introduced to the, just what was going on in terms of this you know, massive availability. Every re- Medical records were digitizing very, very quickly. And new sensors were coming out. So there's this explosion of the availability of digital health data and nobody was there to organize it all. And if you look at the history of, of how markets evolve and how markets get pushed forward, there tends to be, you know, again, whether we, we talked about Twilio earlier, right? Twilio and telecommunications. Now there's a company in, in financial services called Plaid that everyone's really excited about, right? It's, it's these, these sort of, you know, horizontal transaction layers, modern transaction layers, if you will, that end up really creating innovation in a, in a market and looking at the healthcare world, it was, no one was really doing that. And it sort of felt like a perfect storm from a timing perspective. 
and so we just started, you know, writing code, plugging stuff in, just laying laying the bricks, laying the pipes, and you know, here here we are, you know, six seven years later, and and the platform has become what it is. I'm curious, for seven years ago, if you could go back to when when you started it, if you could share, say something to yourself seven years ago that you know now, uh, what would you go back and say? Uh, hire more engineers faster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is this problem is is it just it was it a a, a bigger undertaking than maybe you realized? Yeah, I mean, it, so so it's funny, Alex. Like, I I would say that we started with this incredibly simple vision, which is you know we I I, I described it early as the checkout with PayPal experience. So I want to be able to push a button as a consumer, and I, I don't care where my data is. I just want it to show up. And it turns out we had to build like five companies to make that happen, right? So it, it, which again, turned out to be this incredibly complex problem. Like number one, where is my health data? Most consumers have no idea. And it's, you know, it's buried in these antiquated IT systems that are in, you know, on-prem deployment, sitting in a basement somewhere and a server that hasn't been touched in 15 years. It's, you know, there aren't modern APIs to get to these systems. They're very, fragmented. It's very, healthcare data is an incredibly fragmented market. It's not like I just go and do, you know, two or three partnerships and I'm done. Um, it's, then we had to figure out a way to make that data searchable, right? So when, when we have a, we have a whole uh, sort of complex web of technologies that enable a consumer to say, type in, you know, Dr. Smith, where's your data? Oh, it's Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith practices at this medical facility, which is part of this network, which uses this electronic health record system, which connects to this API. And we constantly update this graph of relationships and keep it updated in real time as consumers are using it. So we had to build that. Um, and then all the normalization technology. So healthcare data is not structured. It's not clean. It's, you know, very, every, every electronic health record system implements standards a little bit differently. There aren't really standards to speak of. It's a lot of messy, noisy data. And so then we had to go solve that problem and, and, and you know, turn to get a modern clean API that a developer wants to work with or anybody wants to work with. We had to do a ton of lifting on and just ingesting data, running NLP models, understanding the processing and the structure of that data so we could create these ontologies so we can make these modern APIs happen. So um, I guess, you know, like I said, hire more engineers faster. It's, uh, we, I didn't realize at the time that we would have to build to achieve that, I think very simple, but very powerful vision. We had to build like five companies. It was crazy. <laughs> this this concept of, of, okay, let's just go get the data, but then it's in all sort of places, antiquated um, concepts, and then it's all structured differently. Uh, and now to keep it updated, have you built then as, as part of your, your platform, is it mostly automated or do you just have teams of people that are constantly going through the data and making sure it's still operating properly and coming through cleanly? Oh, no, it's it's automated. I mean, that's a, a big, big part of the heavy lift here was, you know, obviously we've had experts in the company. I mean, to build these models, these are these are very complex systems to to not just engineer the transaction of, but actually the the understanding and interpretation of that data. But uh, absolutely, it's gotta be automated. I mean, at the scales we deal with, just to give you one example, you know, our network was recently put in place for, and I, I can't name the airlines, but for a, a, a several states in the United States that are operating, uh, you know, testing out vaccine passports with airlines for all, us all, you know, we're, we're recording this in, in May of, of 2021, right? We're on the verge, hopefully, knock wood, of, of reopening here from the from the COVID pandemic. And you know, the ability to verify someone's negative vaccine result in real time is, uh, you know, I mean, first off, it's 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 incredibly powerful, but it's it's just like having to do that for the scale of I'm trying to get on a flight. This has to happen in. 17 seconds or I'm going to be dissatisfied as a consumer. I mean, it's all that, all that plumbing, all that normalization, all that platform technology, that's what we've been investing in. So it's, it's fully automated. It's working now. Like, like someone, this has working for an airlines. Would this happen? Oh, yeah. 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 We're, we're doing this for, for uh, we're doing this for stadiums. We're doing this for some return to work. Uh, we're doing this for airlines. And, and, you know, you've, you've been reading about all the college campuses that are, 
mandating vaccines for a return to work. You know, it, I think it's it's going to be the market's still up in the air in terms of where it's. You know, some folks are saying we're going to have them. Some folks are saying we're not. Again, from our perspective, back to what we were saying earlier about pushing innovators forward. You know, we're we're that transaction. We're we're the only company that can provide real time verification of that across the country. And then each sort of private business can do with it what they want, right? Some folks are going to say, this is really important to me reopening my place of work. And other folks are going to say, you know what, I'm, I'm good with, with the honor system. And, you know, we're, we're, we're happy on both sides. It's an amazing and, and very uh, applicable use case for right now that I think we can all understand that immediate, yes, uh, I don't have a, any COVID and be able to use it. Now, to make that happen, as you say, this has been seven years in the making to, 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 to build this together. And you you made a statement there that there's no competitors. Is that really true? Like there, there's nothing uh, a competition for that has access to to the, the quantity of of I guess data points that are coming in the, that clean output. Yeah, I mean, and and you see this play out in in a lot of markets that have you know these large horizontal platforms, right? Because like name Twilio's closest competitor, I bet you can, or Plaid's, right? I mean, it's, it's what, what ends up happening. And it's not that we don't have competition, right? I think what ends up happening is the competition is, is localized to the specific market. So there, there are sort of these two categories, right? There are folks that are doing what I would consider the analog to our digital. So I mentioned fax machines a little bit tongue in cheek, but the majority of healthcare data in this country still gets transacted by fax machines. And there are huge organizations that have call centers and, and, you know, with hundreds of rows of folks that are calling up doctor's offices saying, I need to get Alex's medical records faxed from point A to point B. And yeah. So there's other people, yeah. Yeah. there's other people solving the problem, just not in a very tech savvy way or futuristic way. Right. Yeah. And and certainly, you know, and, and look, we, in some cases we have partnerships with folks when there is that last mile and, and, you know, we, the 10% of the time we can't get the data digitally, we have to go get it that way and digitize it. We've, we've got that capability as well. But what's really important to, to understand is that, you know, it's, it's all of this kind of, any competition we face in my view is all about, it's like stuff that's holding the industry back. You know what I mean? Like we're, we're the modern version of where the industry needs to go in my view. And I think the more we make data liquid, the more you're going to push innovation forward. And so, you know, it just happens that in healthcare, you've got, you've got such a need to have this horizontal aggregation layer because things have been traditionally so fragmented that you can't, that's why I think some of these, some of these very vertically oriented competitors, they build really nice point to point solutions, but they haven't been able to scale a network to 295 million lives and 40,000 sources. I mean, getting access to all those providers, was that easy? I mean, did they like, yeah, here, uh, here's a connection to our database. Wow. Yeah, no, it was, uh, look, I think, um, so <laughs> easy. Uh, no, I think the, um, I think what's, what's really, and, and again, this comes back to the, the core principle of putting the consumer at the center. I think that's the only thing that made it possible, right? Because look, these providers, they, they are under a tremendous amount of pressure to upgrade their electronic health record systems. Uh, you know, there, there, were, there were huge incentive programs put in place by the government to help them do that. But those incentive programs came with very onerous restrictions on exactly how and what systems they should put in place and what functionality those systems needed to have. And so I think oftentimes, you know, these providers will get a bad rap because yes, they're not, they don't have very modern technology in place. The thing that solves that problem I think elegantly and uniquely to human API is when you have the consumer at the center, right? Because every single one of these systems has methodologies in place to allow consumers to access their data. And that premise is what allowed us to scale as quickly as we did. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it, it's, and I would say again, very importantly, it was not easy, right? I mean, it just all, everything I described at the, at the start of this conversation around how do we even figure out where this data is and what, you know, I could say something like Stanford, Stanford health system. I mean, that we're talking about 27 different electronic health record systems configured two dozen different ways across multiple databases. It's, it's not one single place, but you as a consumer, you'd never think that, right? And so we've got to, 
part of our value add, a big part of our value add is we've got to take all that problem away and make it super, super simple, like a one, one-stop shop API. So if I, if I could understand correctly here, the government has already been pushing for healthcare data to access. And, and so all, all these places have been working on it to provide it. But it's not like there's a phone book that now you just go down the line and say, all right, let's connect to there, 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 there. You've been having to search and connect all the manually. Very much. Yeah, you, you got it. And we, we built and maintained those systems, again, over the last seven years. It's, you know, it's, it's a, I'll joke it's a labor of love. I think part of what you have to do to get to the grand vision of, of you know, being able to create this data liquidity to, to push innovation forward is you've got to do all that grunt work of making sure that, you know, it's like, it's like building the highway network across the country or laying the telephone poles if you're AT&T. You need that network so that you can get cool stuff like the iPhone and the ecosystem of apps that we all have. To have made this possible, I can imagine that the, the, the team that you've built is, is what's been able to, to ha- make it happen. How big is the team today? Yeah, it's, it's, it's everything. So we're, we're right around 100 people now. Um, we've just started to... Uh, to scale out our go-to-market organization a little more actually. So a big, big, I mentioned earlier, you know, the need to hire engineers. I mean, that's, this has been a very engineering and data science heavy endeavor. We've spent a lot of time, care and, and, and capital there. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's right around the size we are and that's growing very quickly at the moment. Because now it's now, now a need to be able to get even further that people are aware that it exists and that, that this is, is an right. option that people can, can start using. But again, your focus is more on developers, though it wouldn't be bad that end consumers can know about it, but it's not like an end consumer is going to go to Human API and sign up, or do I have that incorrect? No, you, you, you've got it correct in terms of our strategy. Now, as a consumer, you absolutely can go to Human API and, and sign up. And, and now what we're not doing is we're not out there marketing to consumers all day because, you know, it's, it's not a, most of the time, folks are going to find out about us through one of our partners, right? The occasional sort of, you know, tech savvy person that's really interested in their own health data might reach out. And we have started to see more and more of this happening, especially during COVID because, you know, folks were very, you know, one of the things that that COVID did is it created an awareness, I think, for a lot of people about health. I mean, it's become so much more, uh, you know, acute in our society today. And I don't think that's going away. I think that's, that very much is here to stay even after, you know, COVID hopefully is a thing of the past. And again, as, as, a, as it relates to the way consumers hear about us, you absolutely can go sign up, use the product, see our ecosystem of partners, connect your data and, you know, start to, to, to view and understand it and see what else you can do with it as part of this ecosystem. However, most folks and most of our strategy is focused on the B2B side of our business. So your all- business model is built on access to the API itself, correct? Correct. That's right. Okay. So it's not like consumers are charged by the fact no. that you have the data. They can get access to free. It's it, 100% free. Yep. For consumers. It, 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 it's more like, uh, I think some of the ad space is going this way, hopefully, that you can decide if you want to have your data shared to be advertised to um, or not. Um, and it sounds like you, people have the a decision, I, I will give my data to this, this developer or this application or choose not to. Uh-huh. <laughs> Anything you can share, just uh, closing thoughts here of, of looking ahead of, of where that you see the, the space going when it comes to healthcare and technology um, kind of coming up, whether you're something you're excited about that you're developing um, or just the future in general. Yeah. So look, I think there's, um, and, and I mentioned a little earlier, this, this idea of it's hard for us to know because all of the stuff we can imagine right now, I guarantee you there are people smarter than us that will come up with something that is 10 times cooler. Um, so I, I think that as, as it relates to the stuff that we're working on, look, I think we're, we're still in the first inning here. I mean, I, it's, it's really, you build the railroad and, and you start running trains on it, right? And you're, you're moving data around, you're helping folks that are, that are creating value for consumers. And if, if we can replace, look, if we can replace all the fax machines in this country with our API, I think we will, do, we, we will have done and, and put the power in the consumer's hands as part of doing that. We will have done a tremendous service, I believe, to the healthcare industry. But I don't think that's the end game. I think the end game is now that you as a consumer are empowered with that data, 
and this entire ecosystem of partners around there, just like you mentioned, is vying for not selling you ads, but actually creating value. Let me look through your medical history and let me understand, let me get you the best price for your prescription drugs. Let me help monitor your medical fraud to make sure that you're not being billed erroneously. I look through your medical history and I see that you've got a family history of something. Let me suggest you get screened, right, for a specific type of rare cancer. And so I think when you look to the future of what human API can enable, it's all about those types of solutions. It's all about how can we make people's lives better, happier, and healthier by actually creating and driving this type of value. Now that the data is liquid, what can we do with it? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not that much of a cynical person, but I, I know there are, there are some people out there that, again, they look at this and wonder about the privacy of it. Okay, I give, ac- I give access now to say, yes, let people look at it. But does then, does everyone, all these developers start seeing me as a person and know all about me? Maybe just help me understand a bit more in our viewers of, of what does it come down to privacy-wise? Yeah, and, and for those that are interested, we've got an entire section of our website dedicated to data security, privacy, and and specifically consumer control, our promise to consumers, the safeguards we put in place. Um, You're always in control as a consumer. And what does that actually mean right behind the, because here's the thing, the the world is going this way. So not only, I believe it's the morally right thing to do to give consumers control over this, but the world is also, we're seeing this with legislation, whether it be GDPR in Europe, uh, you know, some of the more recent California legislation related to this privacy. So, Look, you as a consumer via human API, first off, we can't access, view, or transmit your data without your explicit consent in any instance. Human API is never white labeled as a product, which means that you are always aware of the fact that human API is part of this transaction as a consumer. So you know exactly where your data is going, you know, from point A through us to point B, you're always in control. You can save that data with us or you can choose to delete it completely and you can say, you know, think of the checkout as a guest option. Um, so we built a lot of security and compliance controls in place as part of the fabric of the company so that we can actually offer this type of service and not have to worry about, you know, the, the, the terrible um, sort of reality that might befall a consumer whose health data gets in the wrong hands. I, I appreciate the, the, the focus on it because I, I feel like that is the future and it's like already doing the right thing right now <laughs> so you, you're, you're future proofing it the white hat versus black hat mentality or however you want to look at it but it's um, it, you mentioned it was like we're all headed in this direction of, of more data everywhere and I feel like legislation or, or, or something on the insurance side they, this year they were supposed to they were set to they have to have their data available is that correct like there was a law that passed yeah that's right so um, it's and again they're Versions of this law have been rolling for for a while now, um, but everything legislatively is pointed towards consumers have to, they're, they're, no information blocking is allowed by providers is, is the right way to think about it. So as a consumer, I have the right to obtain my data. Now there's nuance to that and how much the provider can charge you for it and you know how what mechanism they can deliver it to you in, like a CD-ROM that you don't know how to read. Um, but but fundamentally, the idea is, as a consumer, if I knock on the door of my provider and I say, I need a copy of my data, they cannot make a refusal to that request. For you, just uh, looking ahead to the future, um, just for fun, if you could wave your hand and have any futuristic sci-fi solution appear, um, anything that com- comes to your mind that you're like, man, if I could just have this, that would be great. You mean r- related to this specifically or open-ended in some ways. Open-ended. I mean, I look, I would say I, I would love for us to get incredibly cheap genome sequencing. I think it is a, it is, and, and we're heading there obviously, but when, when I look at the, you know, between that, the, the microbiome, these areas of our health that we're still, you know, when, when you look across all of the different types of healthcare data that exist, Sensor technology is catching up, um, medical records, obviously. Digitizing that data, making it liquid is an an incredibly powerful and important um, endeavor. There are other aspects of our health that we're just starting to measure and understand now. So we're a little earlier than, you know, some of this. We, we We can measure things like our blood glucose continuously now, and we can infer some very powerful things from that. 
when we will be able to measure genes in the same way and whether, you know, they turn on and turn off based on certain epigenetic factors. And I think we're going to have a, again, it, it, it's like the next level of what can we build on top of that to help improve the quality of human life. And I think that's, if we could get there faster, man, I'd be, I'd be very excited about that. I love it. I love the, the, the future that you paint. Thank you so much, Andre, for, for sharing both what you, your personal mission and the company vision of where you guys are headed. Uh, for those that want to learn more, definitely go to humanapi.co.co uh, and, and sign up, look at your own data and I guess the availability that's out there. Um, thanks again, Andre. It was a good conversation. Thanks for having me, Alex. This was great. Really appreciate it. And we'll see you all guys on the next episode of Uptech Report. Have you seen a company using AI, machine learning, or other technology to transform the way we live, work, and do business? Go to uptechreport.com and let us know.